In tonight's episode of A House Divided, we begin at the beginning of the story of American democracy with the words of George Washington. Every year on Washington's birthday, a member of the United States Senate reads George Washington's farewell address on the Senate floor. The political parties alternate and in, in this yearly ritual, and so this year a Democrat will read Washington's farewell address because last year, Republican Senator Rob Portman was the reader, and it is fitting that weeks after the insurrection at the Capitol, a Republican senator was forced to read George Washington's warnings about the danger of what political parties could become, saying that a party, quote, agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot, and insurrection. George Washington got his predict predicted insurrection driven by a political party on January 6, 2021. And a year later, our political literature is experiencing a sudden surge of consideration of the possibility of the next civil war. That is, in fact, the title of our next guest's book, The Next Civil War, which takes its place in the bookstores these days alongside How Civil Wars Start by Barbara F. Walter, who joined us in our first episode of A House Divided. The New York Times says, both books provide a sobering vision of where we may be headed, and for that reason, they should be required reading for anyone invested in preserving our 246-year experiment in self-government. Joining us now is Stephen Marsh, author of The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Uh, make your case about what you see coming from your perspective in Canada, uh, looking down in more ways than one uh, on the current state of affairs in the United States. Well, I mean, the United States is a textbook case of a country headed for civil war. It has all the attributes that lead to what the sociologists and economists and historians call a complex cascading system, hyper-partisanship, uh, environmental degradation, high levels of inequality, and low levels of solidarity, as well as, you know, declining faith in institutions and a, and a, and a rising tendency to violence. And, you know, more or less what I see uh, broadly is a struggle over the meaning of America and that expressing itself through violence. You, you say in your book, you say the United States is coming to an end. The question is how? In your view, how? Well, there's, I mean, the book offers like, spe it's speculative nonfiction, so there's many different ideas of how it could do. I mean, it could be a conflict with a sheriff who decides not to obey the mandates of the federal government. Um, it could be sort of a broader terrorist act that causes martial law to be imposed. I, I think the, the point of the book is really that uh, America political landscape right now is very dry tinder. Uh, it is it is rife with uh, the possibility of violence, and you know it, it, you know less than twenty percent of Americans have faith in their electoral system. Uh, a recent poll said that thirty three percent of Americans believe that violence against your own government is sometimes warranted. Um, you have these conditions that are ripe for for conflict, and which we've seen everywhere else in the world. Right. Um, you know, America is an exceptional country, but it also doesn't really defy the laws of gravity and the, it doesn't defy the laws of political gravity. And so it is it is now coming, you know, sort of it's 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 sown the uh, sown the wind and it's about to reap the whirlwind. Uh, you know, the, I think the, the way it's going to fall apart is really the struggle between chaos and order. It, it won't look like the, the first civil war with, you know, boundaries and borders and like pitched armies, it'll look more like insurrection and insurgency and fragment, fragmentation, fragmentation at a very, very low level, every, every fragmented everywhere. How would it look any different from what we already experienced uh, beginning in 1969, for the most part, going on from there during the Nixon presidency and the Vietnam War, where we were having bombings in this country, multiple bombings against federal buildings like post offices every week? Uh, this is a much forgotten chapter of American history. Uh, we had troops at Kent State shoot and kill unarmed uh, anti-war protesters. Uh, 
everything that I've heard you describe as the as this possible future and Professor Walter described as a possible future, I personally lived through. Uh, and the country did not ever yeah. think at that point that we were on the verge of civil war. Yeah, I mean, the, the violence in the 60s was very substantial. So, you know, there were 140 cities burned after MLK was assassinated. Uh, you know, as you say, there were multiple bombings daily sometimes in the United States. But the difference between the 60s and now is that during the 60s, you had a relatively high level of institutional cohesion. So you, you had, like, the Voting Rights Act passed with bipartisan support. You had uh, the president, uh, the president uh, mourned collectively by both parties. Um, you had you had you know Watergate in hindsight was the system working because you had you had uh, the press reporting on corruption politicians taking the press reports seriously and you know both parties deciding that that was unacceptable for for their country and none of that would really happen anymore you know the institutions have gotten to the point where you know not even you know the two parties cannot get together to mourn a slain officer killed in a riot protecting their personal physical security um, also you know. Compared to the 60s, the, the organizations of the militias and the size of the of the groups willing violence is is much higher. Like the weathermen at their peak were about a thousand members, and you know the the, the militias are are much more sized than that now. The uh, as as we go forward, uh, the what would you look for as an indicator of turning away from this risk? And and by the way, uh, just a parenthetical question: What is the richest country in the world? that has fallen into civil war, because standard of living is one of the risks of entering a, uh, losing a standard of living is one of the risks of entering a civil war, but that's not present in many of the countries that enter a civil war because there isn't anything really to lose. Well, some of the, I mean, in history, some of the richest countries have fought, like, you know, you could say that France was one of the, when it hit the revolution, was quite rich, but it had these enormous levels of inequality at the same time. So no, that, no that 20th level, century, let me just pause, no 20th century example of one of the richest countries in the world falling into civil war. I can't think of a first world, a world, uh, first world country off the top of my head that did fall into civil war. No, um, but you know that doesn't mean it doesn't. I mean, the United States in the eighteen sixties was the richest country in the world by far, right? So, uh, and, and you know, 20, 20, in the twentieth century and in the twenty first century, like we're not talking about civil war uh, as it was understood in the nineteenth century. We're talking about insurgency. We're talking about low levels of, 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 of. We're talking about relatively high levels of political violence rather than uh, you know organized pitch. Armies, or what we're seeing in, say, Burkina Faso or the like.